So we are going to continue our series on the Good Samaritan. And if you weren't here last week, it won't matter. Uh, you'll be able to get everything you need from this week. But just to remind you, Jesus was talking to a crowd about what it meant to be a neighbor. And Jesus redefined the idea of being a neighbor because the religious leaders at the time felt like that being a good neighbor was um, just uh, relating well to somebody in a really small subset of people that um, were Jewish people that agreed with them, that obeyed the rules like they wanted uh, them to obey the rules. And they sort of controlled and manipulated religion to the point where only a few people were getting in. And Jesus was done with it. He was fed up with it. He said, a neighbor is somebody who, like the Good Samaritan, crosses cultural, religious, economic, socioeconomic bounds and um, reaches out, who notices, who gets involved, who isn't a separatist, but somebody who connects. And uh, in this redefinition of neighbor, it brings me to my topic this morning. And the topic this morning is one that I think you and I may be dealing with um, on a real-time basis. And that is, how does a Christian navigate or operate in the world that we live in when we are faced with so many choices, so many places, so many things that seem to contradict our Christian values? Um, what do we do? The message today is titled or entitled The Good Samaritan on Target and Bud Light. We may not get to the second part today, but we're definitely going to get to the first part. You have to be not paying attention to anything to not have seen on the news and on Facebook, people talking about Target lately and all the things Target's doing or has done and, and how, what Christians should do or shouldn't do. And it's not a new issue. I mean, we as Christians have faced these issues for years and years and years. To boycott or not to boycott, that's the question. And I believe the Bible speaks to it. But I've had many conversations with you guys, with people in our other service and uh, those who maybe aren't here this morning, um, and uh, genuine heartfelt conversations about what do we do? What does a Christian do? Because so many people are telling me what a Christian does. I have my grandma telling me what a Christian does and a pastor who I grew up with or somebody who I send money to and they tell me what I have to do and so many of my friends on social media are pressuring me and I don't know and they asked and we discussed the, some of the biblical issues and I realized my wife and I, when we hung up the phone on Sunday afternoon last week after having one conversation with a, a good friend that we've never really taken a hard look at scripture for ourselves in light of the issue of where to shop or not to shop. To boycott or not to boycott, what does a Christian do? And to be honest, um, I have taken the word of people who've gone before me, some pastors who may have taught on the subject for people who I respected, people who had loud voices and just sort of assumed it's what the Bible said and what the Bible taught. Perhaps you've done the same thing. Today, I wanna talk to you about what the Bible says about Target and every other organization that may have something in their corporate values or practice that contradicts biblical standards. In Acts, the book of Acts, there was a, I'm trying to see if I have your attention by now. I'm not sure if I do or not. I hope you're as interested in this as me because Joy and I went on a journey this week together to figure out, are we right? Is this what the Bible says? And if we're uncomfortable or if we're wrong, we're gonna change because we wanna conform to the word of God, not conform the word of God to us. And so I'm gonna invite you into the process that we went through and uh, let you know the conclusions that we arrived at. And we'll probably have to do it in two weeks because I intended to do it in one, but in the first service, I got through exactly 50% of it. And I uh, wanted to keep going, but everybody wanted to go to lunch. We took a vote. I lost. And so they're gone and you're here. Uh, we didn't really take the vote, but it's really going to be very interesting to you, I think. And in the early church in Acts chapter 15, this issue came up and they didn't have target. They had idols and they didn't have materials that you would go and purchase. They had meat that people were eating. And you say, what's the big deal? Who cares? It's just meat. But there was a system that the meat represented that was very consistent to what you and I deal with, with the businesses that we choose to patronize or not patronize. The Bible talks about meat offered to idols in Acts, in Romans, in 1 Corinthians, in Revelation, scattered throughout the entire New Testament, meat offered to idols. There was meat that was being sacrificed to idols in devil worship, idolatry, Paul called it evil. Christians, according to 1 Corinthians 8, were going into the temples and they were eating at the snack bar. They were purchasing the meat that was coming from the temple to support financially the revenue going into the temple so that they could perpetuate their demonic practices. 
They were eating meat out of their homes and in people's homes that may or may not have come from these temples. And they had two groups of people that were scandalized by it. They had some who said, if you shop at Target, you're not a good Christian. No good Christian would ever go in there. And some who said, it's just a store. What's the big deal? But the situation was a little different because this was the first church and this was really the first dispute. And in this church, they had Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And the Gentile Christians had come out of this pagan worship where they, when they worshiped at the temple, in some cases, it involved prostitution. It involved all kinds of immorality. It involved sacrifices that were definitely questionable, practices that are anti-biblical. And because we have kids in here, it's not necessary to explain or describe to you the things that went on, but they were every bit as bad or worse as any corporation that we talk about in our world today. And in this church, we have Gentiles coming out of that background, Jews coming out of a background of legalism, and the Bible even says there were Pharisees that had become believers and the Pharisees loved the law. My wife loves the law, joy. She likes rules. I don't like rules. It's not that I don't like law. I just don't always worry about the rules. And joy and I, well, I, I should back up a little. I went and played golf on Thursday with some men from church and I got whipped. I mean, it's not any surprise if you played golf with me, I got whipped. But, you know, I'm not the most competitive person in the world, but I got beat. Um, quit There's one over here who beat me and he's smiling. I can see you in the dark. Stop it. Um, and it uh, happened first service too. I got whipped. And so I, I, I told my wife, I was like, Joy, I got to go practice. So Friday afternoon, uh, the two of us went to the golf course to practice. She wasn't going to practice. She said she doesn't want to play golf because she can't remember all the bad words she's supposed to say after each shot. She doesn't know which words. I said, Joy, I don't think you were listening to me. You were listening to, to somebody else, but she had other, other thoughts. Um, but Joy loves rules. I'm out there to work on my game, work on my swing. Uh, she was like, you want me to video your swing? And I said, uh-uh, I want to think I have a good swing. I don't want to see it, so I know how bad it is. But I, she was, you want me to keep score for you? And I'm like, uh-uh, don't keep score for me. And uh, I, I said, look, on the windshield here, there's a little screen up here on the top, and it's got an automatic scoreboard, and I'll keep my own score. And she kind of looked at me, and she went, huh. And she grabbed a scorecard and kind of stuck it down by her leg. She was driving. So on the first hole, she's like, what'd you get? Four. She went, oh. And I put it up there, four, up on the, you know, on the, scoreboard. And I look over and she's writing something down on the card. Next hole, what'd you get? Six. Oh, six. Put it up on the card. She writes down something down here. By about the sixth hole, I'm like, what is the problem? And she said, well, um, I, you know, I'm keeping score. Why are you keeping score, Joy? I keep my own score. I don't care about every single rule. She goes, well, I do. I've never seen the pros use their foot and kick the ball out <laughs> to a better lie. She said to me, I've never seen somebody say that drive doesn't count because there was somebody in my fairway. And I said, you're keeping score? I'm playing golf. And I said, why? And she said, internal audit. And that's what she said. Um, and uh, she kept the score. At the end of our round, the scores were different. That's how my wife likes to rule. She loves the rules. Well, they had people in the early church who love rules. Pharisees, can you imagine having a business meeting with Pharisees? I mean, they're the ones who get out every rule and regulation and, and they want to make sure all boxes are checked and all I's are dotted and all T's are crossed. They want to argue every point. And they had a huge issue in the church. The Pharisees who'd become Christians and the Jews who'd become Christians said, no Christian can have anything to do with idols. You can't eat the meat, can't shop. The Gentiles who'd become believers, they said, we can do whatever we want because we have freedom in Christ. Now, it didn't really start with the issue of meat. It started with the issue of circumcision. And the Pharisees said, you can't be a Gentile if you hadn't been, or a Christian if you hadn't been circumcised. And the Gentiles were like, what are you talking about? Nobody told me that in the membership class. And, uh, you know, they had this big argument about circumcision. And then Paul and Barnabas got really upset and said, you got to quit telling people they have to get circumcised to be a believer. That's just not true. The Holy Spirit's doing wonderful things with the Gentiles. They're saved. And they said, oh yeah, well, that might be true, but they eat this meat that's offered to idols so they can't be Christians. So they had this council. Paul and Barnabas went to Jerusalem and they had a council, a group of, of leaders, church leaders who met together and tried to decide what to do. And we see this written about in Acts chapter 15. And the apostle Paul, as he goes and meets with these, these church leaders, they have this discussion and they say, 
because one side of the church is so immature and feel like all the rules have to be followed and the other side of the church is so immature and feel like there are no rules and we can do whatever we want, we have to make a decision based on the unity of the church because the church is immature. So they got together and they had to decide. If we tell people they can eat whatever it is they wanna eat, the meat, sacrifice to idols, even though it's a gray area, it's neutral, it's neither right nor wrong, if we tell them they can do it, what are the consequences? Well, the Gentiles, they might fall back into their idol worship because they've barely left the temple. Where these Christian Jews, they might fall back into their legalism and get stifled with the rules. And they literally decided what is worse between two immature parties. And they said the worst thing would be for a Christian Gentile to fall back into idol worship because we may never get them back. When the Jew falls back into legalism, we've dealt with that. We know how to handle that. The danger is not quite as great. So they made a decision. And Paul said, the Holy Spirit has informed me that we as a church will not shop. But it wasn't because you're not supposed to shop. It was because there were two extremely immature groups of people who were warring against each other. So it was a decision made for unity based on immaturity. And so many people look at that passage and say, this is what the church should do. We should not shop. But the apostle Paul said, and he clarifies in 1 Corinthians 8, that eating this meat, which involved in some cases, as you can read for yourself, going into the temple and eating at the snack bar, going to the market and purchasing from the booth or having it in your home is a gray area. You can eat or not eat and it's not sin. It's a matter of your conscience. But if your decisions cause a weaker brother or sister to fall into sin, then you should always choose the safer option, which is to protect the weaker brother and sister. Now, you may ask, and I hope you do, who are the weaker brother and sister? Friends, the weaker brother or sister are not hyper-religious Christians who are preoccupied with rules who want to judge you for everything that you do that they think you shouldn't do. They're people who have come out of a lifestyle of sin who your behavior with the freedoms that you choose to exercise might cause them to slip back in to that area of sin. Does that make sense? To say, no, I will not would be for one of two reasons. One, that it's an issue of my own conscience, me worried that I will fall into that sin or somebody close to me. Now, number two, I will, well, we have to be cautious. Now, Paul said, you decide, but be careful not to destroy the weaker brother. Now, it's kind of an interesting thing because the Bible doesn't have too many gray areas, but in this one issue, Paul says, this is a gray area. And in our application, it's literally shop or don't shop. You can shop if you want. You cannot shop if you want. Be cautious and careful that there are new Christians around you and you need to make sure that you don't do anything to cause them to stumble in their faith. But Paul goes on to talk about how crazy it is for you and I, as we're making our own convictions and conclusions, to expect the world to act in a way that the world simply can't act. He goes on to clarify after this issue of unity. He talks about this issue of expectation. And we see that Paul says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. That's pretty hardcore, isn't it? Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, are immoral or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters. And he's recognizing that there are people in this world who are. Um, he said, if in that case, you would have to leave the world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anybody in the church who has perpetual unconfessed sin and lives in a way that's contrary to biblical principles. He goes on and he says, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. For us to expect the world around us 
to live according to biblical principles is insane because the only thing that allows us to live according to biblical principle is the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life that has indwelled a believer. Paul says for you to, to avoid any kind of inconsistency to scripture, you have to literally leave the world. That there's no way to even be here and not be around stuff that's not biblical. And many will say, well, I can't be associated with evil. And I remember Jesus when he called Matthew, the tax collector as his disciple, went to Matthew's house and had a party. And the Bible says that there are all kinds of sinners in there, all manner of sinner. And um, I see it this way. Jesus is in the middle of the party, hanging out. Why? Because he loves the people who are there. Does he agree with their behavior? No. But that doesn't mean he's disagreeable. It doesn't mean he's a separatist. It doesn't mean he stands over here lobbying truth and hoping that it hits them. He's with them. The disciples may be somewhere on the periphery, maybe like halfway in the party, halfway out, not sure if I should be here. Um, the Pharisees come up on the outside, with their arms folded. Jesus shouldn't be in there. He's in target. Only sinners would go in there. And Jesus said, I came to this world to reach the, the lost, not the saved. Jesus said, where else would a Christian be but among people who need a witness? Now, remember, you can choose to shop or you can choose not to shop, just like they could choose to eat or not choose to eat. But here's the deal. And by the way, you can't judge somebody for having a different conviction than yours. It's called freedom in Christ. But here's the deal. Here's what we can't do. This is what we can't do. Absolutely cannot do. You can choose to shop or not to shop, but you can't choose to talk about it. So what do you mean? I just have to share the truth. I got to speak the truth. Let me show you what the Bible says. Lots of pastors and commentaries like to skip this passage. But let me just show you the word of God and take you through the same journey that my wife and I went on as we wanted God's word to pierce our heart and to inform our lives so that we can stand for what's right, but we can also stand with people who may be living in a way that's inconsistent. It's powerful. Stick around. The Apostle Paul says in Romans, he talks about making sure that we live a life that's peaceful, that we're looking to edify each other, that we don't destroy the witness of God for points that are gray and irrelevant. Be concerned about the weaker brother. And then this is what he says. Verse 22, this could be a memory verse for you and a memory verse for me. And it's one I've been struggling with all week. So whatever you believe about these things, the gray areas, where you can or you can't. He says, keep them to yourself. Keep them between you and keep them between God. Do not traffic your opinions to the people around you. They do not need to hear your version of truth on the gray areas. Which, for me, Stepped on my toes a little bit and I was wearing white shoes. What do you mean keep my mouth shut? It's my right as a Christian and as American to tell people what I think. No, it's my right or responsibility as a Christian to make sure that what I say is edifying, that builds up and doesn't tear down and that leaves a great witness, a testimony for my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. At least three ways I can think of or three reasons why we should keep our mouths shut. Number one, 
if you keep your mouth shut about your personal convictions, and I mean on Facebook, on Instagram, with people who you happen to run into who love to collect opinions. Do you ever have people in your life who just like to collect opinions? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And they just want to know. And when people come and ask me a question, even like this, my first question is, why do you want to know? Are you just collecting an opinion so that you can judge me and call me unspiritual because my conviction is different than yours? Then no, I'm not going to tell you. But if you're on a search, let's talk. But the first reason I think that we are responsible before God to keep our mouths shut in these gray areas is because if God convicts my heart and your heart after I have told dozens of people, if I've gone public with my convictions, and then God changes my heart, my pride is not going to allow me to step back. It's like talking bad about people. You talk bad about people to 100 people, you go back and say, I'm sorry to the person, but not the other 100 people. We talk bad about them too. Same thing. We can't change because we're too proud. It gives us obstacles to growth and how far from the heart of the Lord would it be for us to say, my convictions are right and I will never change. Now, on the things the Bible doesn't call gray, absolutely we have conviction. But on the things where the Apostle Paul says, these are things you can decide for yourself. I will never change. That sounds a lot like the Pharisees keeping score in the golf cart. (laughs) I'm, I'm just kidding about that. Second reason. You guys want the second reason? You don't want the second reason? Yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Why not? We'll hear, we'll hear the second reason. First reason is uh, that we need to make absolutely certain that God can still inform our heart. Here's the second reason. The second reason is that if I keep my convictions quiet to myself in the gray areas, no one's going to call me a hypocrite because the second you say you don't or you won't to a person who doesn't know Jesus, they are going to ask you why you do all of the things you do that are the same exact thing. And if you want to take every single company that has something in their corporate values that's contrary to biblical principles and live consistently, my friend, you're going to end up making your own clothes, living in a house that you built, driving a buggy pulled by a horse on the road somewhere in Missouri that people have to drive around in traffic because it's just not possible. But the definition of hypocrisy is saying I believe something but acting in a way that's different. We can't pick and choose when we go public with our mouths. Consistency is at least what you owe if we choose to violate the spirit of Romans 14. And then the third reason, and it's really important, and that is that by me or you trafficking my opinions for the sake of truth, telling you all of the issues. If these issues weren't really issues for you, I've just made them issues. And I've put something in your life that can cause you to have an issue of conscience and can cause you to sin when it wasn't even an issue in the first place. I thought when I stood up here today that I was going to list all the companies that we have to make decisions over. And you know, there's a bunch of them. And I thought, why in the world would I do that? Then you guys will be taking a list of companies and you'd have to go research them and you'd have to figure out. And Paul says, if you don't know, don't ask. And if you do know and you choose, you're not supporting it. It's possible to go in and be and, and purchase and it, it's not a big deal. You choose. If you choose not to, not a big deal. It's your prerogative. Don't judge each other, but keep your mouth shut because some of the people that some are trying to judge, others are trying to reach. And we make these issues of conscience, issues that divide and polarize us from the very people Jesus came to reach. So, what do I mean? I mean, choose to shop or choose not to shop and make it an act of conscience. Choose not to share because that's a biblical mandate. I don't believe boycotts are biblical. I don't believe that a Christian has the right to join a public movement 
to try to form enough economic power to coerce a non-Christian organization into compliance with my biblical principles because I believe that that's fighting like the devil to try to honor the Lord. You may believe differently and that's okay. But I think it's impossible for us as believers to wade into a economic power struggle based on numbers to try to conform people to the image of the Holy Spirit or Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's insanity. But for years and years, we've been trying to do it. So where does that leave us as Christians? It leaves us sort of in a quandary. My wife, Joy, when we were talking, she said at first, she goes, Rick, don't preach this message. She said, preach it. And then we see who leaves the church, right? And I said, Joy, this message comes from the Bible. You and I weren't 100% sure where we were going to land on this at the end of the week. Why would I disrespect my friends by assuming that you guys won't look at scripture and allow the Holy Spirit to give you a landing where your conscience is clean and you are acting according to your principles given to you, not sent to you by some email or shared with you on Facebook or passed down from some generation. But they're yours because you take the word and you hold it up and you view the world through the pages of scripture. And I understand that that opinion is in at least a divided minority of many pastors. But I'm not worried about that because I'm convictional. I'm convinced that this is the spirit of the law, the intent of the law, and even the letter of God's law as you and I choose to live for Christ. So we're gonna sing a couple songs and this is exactly what happened first service. If you look at your notes in your app, you see that I have lots and lots of notes and, and I'm gonna have to wait until next week because I don't have any more time, but next week is when the good stuff happens. I'm just gonna tell you, and I hate doing this to you because I know that some of you won't be here next week and I know some of you can't, some of you probably just won't. I know some of you forget, like, like me, you sleep once, you know, I don't remember what happens and you sleep twice and you're like, I don't even know where I was. You ever watch a movie and you have to like watch three or four minutes of it and you're like, oh, I watched that last week, right? Um, I get that and I don't want you to miss this because next week we're gonna talk about if we choose to open our mouths, the, the importance, the imper I mean, absolutely how imperative it is that we are consistent, that we are correct and that we are careful with our witness. We're gonna talk about the exception to the rule when you and I have to stand up and say no, when we have to not be involved. We're gonna talk about Paul's close friend who realized that to be a missionary, you didn't have to go overseas, that you could stay where you were. Paul left him in Corinth and he became the comptroller, the manager of the entire city of Corinth and lived his entire life there, influencing from the inside, presiding over both the Christian church and the idol worship. And we're gonna end in the book of Revelation where we see that a time is coming where you and I will be forced to either wear the mark of the beast, to purchase, to buy, to sell, or that we'll lose our lives. And then there's no way we don't stand up and stand out apart. So you don't wanna miss next week. But if you do, it'll be online and you'll get to take a look. So the subject that we're talking about is personal. Um, personal to me, it's a... Um, and, you know, I looked at Joy and I'm like, hey, uh, she's over here. I'm like, uh, you know, did I get everything out that I wanted to say? She goes, well, that was a little intense. And, and I said, yeah, you know, Joy's good to temper me that way. Let me explain to you why I'm passionate about this and why you should be too. Because we are um, waging war against the powers of evil and the weapons we fight with aren't the weapons this world fights with, which is why I'm so passionate and convicted that we are not in an economic bullying war as to who can out boycott whom. But I believe that when we begin to make inroads as Christians, sharing a genuine faith with the world around us who desperately need Jesus, that sometimes the church takes back that ground by the way we choose to act. And it grieves me because instead of being a witness for Christ, it's the opposite. 
And I feel like we need to make sure we're positioned correctly to where when God gives us ground that we maintain it because it's level at the foot of the cross. So I had to buy golf balls on Thursday because I lose a lot of golf balls. And I'm driving up Delaware because I live in Ankeny. And I turn on our labor and I start driving up Delaware and I have two choices that'll have the golf balls that I want. I got Target on my right and I got Walmart on the left. <laughs> Cue the music, right? I mean, this is Thursday. I've been working on this all week. Joy and I taking the word, looking at it, applying it to our lives, ready to share it with you guys. Got to make a decision. Do I go right? Do I go left? Where do I buy my golf balls? And you know what I decided? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> now, if you want to come and talk to me about the way that I made my decision, one-on-one, -on -one because you're not collecting opinions, but because you genuinely want to know, I'll share with you. But the Apostle Paul was primarily concerned with people being tempted to be involved in the lifestyle that said idol worship was representing. And by their association, their conscience would cause them a conflict because they felt drawn into that old way of life. It was never about association, never about would a Christian do this or that. It was about looking out for the weaker brother who may have come out of sin. So what do we do when we have these conversations? One of the big issues is, is that we believe many of these corporations have a different view of marriage than we have as a church, than we believe the Bible has. I believe a biblical view of marriage is between a man and a woman in a marriage relationship, a covenant relationship that's monogamous, that ideally for life, and I believe that that's God's plan. Now, if you don't believe that, or you've chosen a different conclusion, I will be with you, even though I don't agree with you, and I won't stand for the things that you may stand for that I can't stand for, but I will stand for you as a friend and as a person. Because the only way that I can reach you and be your friend is to be with you. Not like the disciples worried about who was going to see them, one foot in Matthew's house and one foot out. Not like the Pharisees lobbying these truths over the wall, hoping that they hit somebody. But I want to be like Jesus. Now, I'm sort of jumping the gun because this application point really comes next week, but I want to give it to you this week because it might take you two weeks to worry about it. Well, I say worry about it, work on it, whatever. I've been worrying about it and working on it. Okay. We bang this drum a ton, right? Christians, biblical view of marriage, biblical view of marriage, right? And I believe it's a biblical view of marriage. I, 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 I honestly do, wholeheartedly. But do you ever wonder why the world doesn't give a flip about our view of marriage? Why they could care less? If there's nothing compelling about many Christians' view of marriage is because many of us have terrible marriages and they're not blind. We may get the biology right, but we miss the heart of the man and woman becoming one flesh, the mystery of representing the covenant between Jesus and his church, the beauty of a life partner that's compelling, not off-putting. And people aren't stupid. Why would I let you tell me about marriage? I see the way you live. That's what's been landing on me this week. And I'm not passing it on to you before it landed on me. One of the best ways I can stand for a biblical view of marriage is to apply myself to be a life partner living out a biblical view of marriage where I honor and love and prefer my spouse and serve her because that's what Jesus would have me to do. Then when our lives begin to take on some traction because people see this love lived out, perhaps my words about said marriage will land a little better.
Just like Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Worry about the issues we have among ourselves. The world's watching and they'll know whether Jesus is real by our love. God will judge the world. What's our responsibility? To stand for what's right and with the same people who Jesus called his neighbor. Father, thank you for my friends. And as we look at this tough subject, as we talk about these things, I pray that we would not boycott each other, that we wouldn't get mad at each other. And because we have a disagreement, we choose to, to separate in our heart or our proximity, that we wouldn't judge each other for whether we choose to turn right or turn left in a gray area such as this, that we would be careful to protect our witness, your witness, and that as we open our mouths about the way things should be, that we're careful to be living out these things through the power of your Holy Spirit in brokenness and humility, where the world who we think we're talking to can see Jesus, at least in the things we're trying to talk about. I pray, Father, that as we leave, we would leave challenged, that we would leave dependent, that we would leave with conviction, with a desire for unity and to look out for the new and young Christian. And once again, that we would be a part of your redemptive plan, fighting with you, not against anyone. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.